Would you open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11? The Gospel of Mark chapter 11, we're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 to 11. And I would ask, would you stand please for the reading of God's Word in honor of Scripture? Let's stand as I read these these verses. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and he saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, Why do ye loosening the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus has commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat on him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things... And now the evening tide was come. He went out unto Bethany with the twelve. This is God's word. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, help me as I preach this passage to exalt our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage and see this momentous day, when the king of glory entered into his temple, and yet there were very few that received him, that, Lord, we would examine our own heart to make sure that we have an opening and a reception in our own heart to the king of kings. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to Mark's account of one of the most important days of the history of redemption. Mark gives us this narrative about the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. This has been called the Palm Sunday. It's been called the triumphal entry. This was a day when Jesus presented himself as the Messiah, as the son of David. Now, all four Gospels give this account because this is such an important day in the history of redemption. But Mark does something unique here that I think that others do not. He adds a very small detail when Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, and I think that in the Scripture, the details that are added there by the writer are not accidental, because we know that the Scripture is inspired by God. So God wanted us to see this. And so what's the small detail that Mark adds in this narrative? Well, if you notice in verse 11, where it says, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and notice the next phrase, and entered and into the temple, and when he had looked around about upon all things. Mark adds this little detail that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he didn't just enter into the city of Jerusalem, but he went all the way into the temple. Now, we saw earlier in Mark chapter 10, verse 32, that the disciples were amazed at Jesus' determination to go to Jerusalem. In fact, they were afraid because Jesus had already told them several times that when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be delivered over into the hands of the Gentiles. And the disciples were amazed because they saw, despite what Jesus said, there was a determination that they saw in Jesus to get to Jerusalem. The Bible prophesies in Isaiah 50, verse 7, that he set his face like a flint. That is, he was so determined to get there. But, beloved, just know this, that Jerusalem was not his ultimate destination. His ultimate destination was to go there to the temple. Why? Why is this detail so important? We're going to look at that as we examine this narrative. But let me just say this. Chapter 11 begins the last third of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, From this chapter until chapter 16, 
Mark will focus on the last seven days of Jesus' life. So think about that. Ten chapters in Mark focus on three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, but the last six chapters focus on seven days of Jesus' earthly ministry. So you can see there's a great emphasis placed on these last seven days of the ministry of Christ. And because, of course, we know what, why that's true. We know why the gospel writers focus on this last week, because this is the most important week in the history of redemption. We could say in the history of mankind, because what will take place here in this week will be the fulfillment of all that God has promised to redeem mankind from their sin. And so it begins on this Sunday, this Palm Sunday. Now, what I want us to do is to look at this passage, and we'll look at it in three stages. Uh, well, first of all, I call it the preparation, and that is when he's on the Mount of Olives. Look in verse 1, and when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. Now, Jesus, again, he makes his final pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He comes to two small villages on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. Uh, Bethage, it was a little village between Jerusalem and Bethany. It, it means house of figs because of the abundance of figs that were produced in this region. And so he, he stops there. Um, his first stop really is in Bethany right before that. And he spent the night there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, this was the Lazarus that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 that it was no secret that Jesus was there. People came to see Jesus, but they also wanted to come and see Lazarus, whom Jesus had resurrected from the dead. I mean, put yourself in their place. If you had an opportunity to see someone that was dead for a few days and resurrected, wouldn't you like to talk to that person? I have a few questions for him. And they, they came to see Jesus, they came to see Lazarus. And so there was a lot of excitement in the air. This was a highly charged atmosphere because of the things that were happening. And in preparation for Jesus to go into Jerusalem, he sends his two disciples ahead to the little village of Bethage. And in this village, he gives them instructions, verse 2, and he said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye, sh ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat, loose him and bring him hither. So Jesus gives them this instruction. Go to this village, you'll find this colt that's tied there. No man ever sat on this colt. Loose him, bring him to me. And then he says in verse number, uh, verse 3, If any man ask why you do this, what are you doing? You just say that the Lord has need of him. And so it's as if this one little colt is created for this purpose, to carry one rider, the king of kings. Jesus was carried in the womb of a woman who never knew a man. He will be carried on the back of a colt that had never been ridden. He will be buried in a tomb where no one had ever been laid. All of this speaks of sacred use. In the Old Testament, when an animal was put to sacred use, it had to be one which had never been used before for common purposes. But, the, but what's interesting about this is that Jesus knew all of this. This is a proof of his deity. He says, you'll go to this village, you'll find a colt that's tied there. This will be a colt where never a man rode on. How did Jesus know all that? How did he know that? Well, because he's God. He knows all things. He's omniscient. This is a miracle of divine omniscience. This is a glimpse of his deity. He's a God who knows all things. And Jesus knew that they would perhaps be challenged. And he said when they come and say, you know, why are you doing this? You just say the Lord has need of him. The word there, Lord, curious, can be used several ways. But I think the sense of it is you just let them know that the sovereign Lord, the king, has need of him. In the ancient world, including Israel, one of the prerogatives of a king was to be able to commandeer a beast of burden whenever he had the need. And here Jesus is exercising his divine right, and he said to them, you just tell them that the Lord, the king, has need of him. And that's exactly what happened in verse 4. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, 
Why do ye, or excuse me, what do ye, loosening the colt? And they said unto them, even as Jesus has commanded, and they let them go. Again, Jesus knew all of this in advance. And again, that's no surprise to us because he knew all things. The Bible says in John 2, 25, no one needed to bear witness to Jesus about man because Jesus knew what was in man. He knew all about man. He knew what was in their heart. By the way, he knows everything about you. He knows everything that's in your heart. Every thought of yours, he knows. I was reading one time where it says that your iPhones can track your location. It stores it in a hidden file. If you carry an iPhone with you, there's a sense in which every, somebody out there, the, the man behind the computer knows where you are. They can track where you are. All this information, it can be put into a computer, and so you're never really without uh, notice if you're carrying around an iPhone. Does that spook you a little bit? I'll take your iPhones after the service if you want to get rid of them. Let me tell you something greater. Jesus, not only does he track your every movement, he tracks your every thought. He knows everything about you. And he knew all these things. And by the way, all this that took place was in fulfillment of a prophecy Mark doesn't give the prophecy because in Mark's gospel, he's a little bit quicker. He doesn't give as much information as the other gospels. Matthew, in his gospel, when he talks about this event, reminds the reader that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt. And so this prophecy refers to the day that when the Messiah would come into Jerusalem, he would be riding a donkey, he would be riding a colt. This was prophesied 500 years before by the prophet Zechariah. Riding upon this beast of burden, their Messiah would come. Now in the ancient days, whenever a king would present himself, normally they rode on a, a, a horse, a white horse. That represented royalty. It seems inappropriate that any king, much less the king of kings, should ride on a stallion. But here Jesus comes in riding on a beast of burden. And this is not an accident, as we already saw. God prophesied this. And this is wholly appropriate when you understand the whole purpose for which Jesus had come. Jesus himself came to bear the burdens of the world. So it's appropriate that he would come into Jerusalem to present himself as the king that day, riding on a beast of burden. The Bible says in Isaiah that he would be the suffering servant, the one who would come and bear the sins of the world. The Lord would lay on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came as the burden bearer. He came to be our substitute. And so all of this is appropriate. All of this is part of God's plan for his Messiah. And then notice, look in verse number 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat on him. This is the placement. They made a saddle from their garments. They set Jesus on the colt. It doesn't look like much, but this event reveals him as the divine creator who has control over all of creation. This unbroken colt receives Jesus. You ever tried to get on a horse that never had a rider on it? And it was the same, horses had to be broken. It was the same with with donkeys. They had to be broken. But here this unbroken colt receives Jesus. There's no bucking, there's no kicking. He absolutely receives him. It's almost as if he knew instinctively that this person was the Lord of creation. And there's a sense in which this donkey had more sense than the people there. Because this donkey received Jesus. The others there did not. So we see, first of all, preparation on the Mount of Olives. And then notice the second stage of this. I call this procession into Jerusalem. Look at verse number 8. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and straw them in the way. Jesus begins riding toward Jerusalem. 
You have to picture this in your mind. There's a parade of people that are following him. As he comes to the crest of the hill of the Mount of Olives, you can look out east. If you go to the Mount of Olives, it's 300 feet higher than the city of Jerusalem. So if you go there and you go to the top of the Mount of Olives, I've been there many times, you can look out and look down, and there is the city of Jerusalem. And so he comes up the western slope, and now he's at the top of the Mount of Olives, and he's about to descend down the other side. And as he descends down into the city, people are shouting. There's people that are throwing their garments, the Bible says, down, and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger. As, as he's doing this, as he's riding into the city, why did they spread their garments in the way the Bible says there in verse number 8? Well, this was uh, something that was an old custom. It has its roots all the way back in the Old Testament. And uh, in fact, the Bible describes a king by the name of Jehu, who when he was anointed to take the place of the wicked king Ahab, and he was anointed king, that the people as he... Uh, walked, threw their garments down at his feet. It's kind of almost like a, an ancient red carpet. And what does this symbolize? It symbolized that you were submitted, that you were submitting to this person who is the king. And when the people that day were throwing their garments in the way, they were actually saying that we, we believe you to be the king and we are submitting ourselves to you. We submit to your authority. And then they also were cutting down the branches, it says in verse number 8. And others cut down branches off the trees and straw them in the way. They begin to cut down palm branches, and they lay them at his feet. Why palm branches? Well, they were a symbol of joy, but I think it also speaks of something else. Did you know that during one of the feasts, the Feast of the Tabernacles, what people would do is they would, they would make a booth that they called a Sukkot, put it in the field, and people would actually stay there. They would decorate this booth with all kinds of branches and leaves, palm leaves. Why? Because all of that reminded them of the glory of God. It reminded them that when the Jews were in the wilderness and they were living in tents, that they were covered by the glory of God. You remember the glory of God? that pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, it was constantly there. And so there's a sense in which this glory kind of covered all of those tents when God hovered above them in his glory. And there's a sense in which these palm leaves that decorated these Sukkots, these booths, reminded them of the time of the glory of God. It spoke about God's glory. That's a key theme here on this day. And then the Bible says they began to praise the Lord. Look in verse number 9. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they begin to praise him. They're actually quoting from Psalm 118 where it says, Save now, I beseech thee. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They kind of shorten it. And really by quoting that one phrase from that passage, they're referring really to that whole passage there. And it's really a beatitude that addresses the king. And they're saying, save now, save now. They want the Messiah to take control and throw off the shackles of Rome and be their king at that very moment. But they did not realize that the purpose of his first coming would not be political, it would be spiritual. It would be to deliver them from their sins. And so Jesus is riding into Jerusalem as he gets closer. What happens is the people inside the city hear the commotion outside, some that are in the temple, and they run out to meet Jesus. John 12 tells us that. Some people estimate that the crowd that came and surrounded Jesus as he was riding into Jerusalem on that day numbered somewhere around 200,000 people. And they were all crying out, Hosanna. They were welcoming their Messiah. But not everyone understood what was going on. You know, it's easy for people to get caught up in the commotion of a crowd and not really understand what's going on. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, verse 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? The word moved here is a word used for earthquakes. It tells you the commotion of that day. The people were saying, who is this? You know, people were running out. They were hearing others saying Hosanna. And they would run out and they would get a part of it. 
And they would cry, Hosanna. By the way, who is this? Who is this? Some of them didn't know what was going on. And we know that their response was superficial because later on, they will cry out, crucify him. Crucify him. They were spiritually blind. They really didn't know. Like their forefathers that Isaiah preached about, they heard, but they did not perceive. They saw, but they didn't understand. They didn't really know who he was. They should have known this day. In fact, in Psalm 118, where they were quoting, it starts out like this. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. How many have ever quoted that verse? That verse specifically refers to this very day, the Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. This was the day that God had made. You see, because this day was marked on the prophetic calendars of God, to start off the week when redemption would, t- would take place with the Messiah. In fact, this, was, this day was predicted in, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Many scholars, specifically Sir Robert Anderson, demonstrated that this day was predicted by Daniel. And if you do the numbers, you, if, you, if you look at the prophecy of Daniel that says that after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. If you go from the day of when Artaxerxes made a decree until the, the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, if you number those days, you'll find out that this day was prophesied. This very day that Jesus came into Jerusalem was prophesied specifically in the Old Testament. This very day. But why don't you see the third thing here? We see preparation on the Mount of Olives. We see procession into Jerusalem. But then we see presentation into the temple. Again, look at verse number 11. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. This is a very interesting verse to me. I think this is the point where Jesus presents himself officially as the king. When he comes to the temple, what does he do? He comes to the temple, walks in, he looks around. What do you think Jesus saw when he looked around in the temple that day? He saw the money changers. He saw the corruption that was going on, the religious corruption. No one is there really to greet him as who he is. None of the priests or the Levites took notice of who he was. Did you know this was the first day of the week, and according to the ancient rabbis, you know what the priests were doing in the temple at that time? They were quoting Psalm 24. And listen to what Psalm 24 says. I'll read a few verses. Verse 9, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. They were actually quoting that and singing that psalm in the temple on that day. And here Jesus comes to the temple. It's no accident that all this happens. He comes in and he looks around. They take no notice of him. So get this. The people on the streets are asking the question, who is this? And the priests in the temple are singing this song, who is this king of glory, and in a way that nobody could yet understand, they were both saying, who is this? The people on the outside were saying, well, this is Jesus, and the people on the inside saying, who is this king of glory? It's the Lord. There's a sense in which they were both right, but they really didn't see it. They didn't see that Jesus there at the temple at that time was the fulfillment of Psalm 24. He was the king of glory that came into the temple. Do you remember in the Old Testament when uh, God came to Ezekiel? This is in 586 B.C. God came to Ezekiel through a vision, and God showed a vision to Ezekiel where the glory of God came out up off the temple. And in that vision, the glory of God ascended up, and it came down through the eastern gate, through the valley of Kidron, up to the Mount of Olives, and then it, it went away. And what was that? That was the glory of God leaving the temple. Because of the people's disobedience, God left. And you know later on the temple would be destroyed. 
this was the glory of God was always associated with the temple, always. You remember when the, the temple was dedicated? We've been studying this on Wednesday night. When the temple was dedicated, Solomon prayed that prayer. The glory of God came down on the temple in such a great way, the priests had to get out of there because the glory of God was so powerful. But many years later, the glory departed, and the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And that glory had not been seen anymore after that. Now, you know what? Fast forward a little bit later in the history of Israel, after the exile, after the exiles come home and they repatriate Israel, what's the first thing they do? They start building the temple. And after getting distracted for a little while, God raises up the prophet Haggai and tells them, get to work, build a temple. They obey, they build the temple. And then what happens after the temple is built? In Haggai chapter 2, would you just turn there? Let me just show you this real quick. This is worth it. Go back to the book of Haggai. Let me tell you how to get there. Go left, three books. You'll go back to Matthew, and then you'll go back to Malachi, and then you'll come to Zechariah, and then you'll come to Haggai, that little book there. And I want you to look at this here in in chapter number 2 because this is an important Old Testament prophecy. Look in chapter 2. Look down at verse number 3. Now, let me tell you what's going on here. The people had rebuilt the temple, but after they built it, they weren't very happy. You know why? Because the temple that they had rebuilt was not anywhere near what Solomon's temple was. In fact, Ezra says that the young people shouted, but the old people wept. The old people wept because there were some some of them there that still remembered the glory of Solomon's temple. And so Haggai comes to them. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 2. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? And God understands the people. Some of them there are just saying, this temple that we have here now is nothing compared to the temple of Solomon. Not only did the temple of Solomon have greater materials, not only was it more beautiful, but what did the temple of Solomon have? The glory of God. God's glory had visited that temple. And now here's this other temple, and some of the people were disappointed. You ever build something and look at it afterward and say, ah, it's all right. That's what these people were doing. Look at verse number 7. God gives them a prophecy here that encourages them. Look at verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. God said, you know what? Let me tell you what's going to happen. The desire of nations will come to this temple, and I will fill this house with glory. In fact, look at verse 9. And the glory of this later house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And God gives them a word, a promise. God says, look, I know that you're looking at this temple and you're not very impressed, but I want you to know that what's going to happen here is that The the desire of nations is going to come to this temple. What what does he mean by desire of nations? You know what that prophecy is? That's a messianic prophecy. That's speaking of the Messiah. We sing a, a, I know it's not Christmas, but there's a Christmas carol that says, come ye desire of nations, come. You know, the the, the song Hark the Herald Angels Sing, there's one little line in there, come ye desire of nations, come, find in us your humble home. Here the desire of nation is messianic. And notice where he says, and I will fill this house with glory. In verse 9, the glory of this house, the glory of this house shall be greater than that of the former. How is that going to happen? How is God going to fill this other temple with glory? And by the way, this would be fulfilled later on because, of course, that temple there would be expanded and renovated by Herod the Great. And so you have Herod's temple. But you know when this prophecy was fulfilled? That day when Jesus came into Jerusalem, came all the way into the temple, there was the glory of God right there that had come to that latter house. The desire of nations had come. He was there. He was the fulfillment of the song, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And while the priests there were singing it, Jesus was standing right there, and they didn't even recognize him as the king of glory 
who had come. Remember what the Bible says of him? He is called the brightness of his glory. Remember what John says? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus revealed his inward glory? He was the glory of God. And by the way, the route that Jesus came into Jerusalem was the same route that the glory of God departed. The glory of God left the temple, went out through the eastern gate, Valley of Kidron, to the Mount of Olives, and ascended out of sight. Jesus came from the Mount of Olives, came down that same route through the Valley of Kidron, into the eastern gate, into the temple. The route that the glory of God in the Old Testament departed is the route that, the, that Jesus went when he went back into the temple. He was the glory of God that returned back to the temple on that day. He is the king of glory. But they didn't see it. The people didn't recognize it. He was the fulfillment of that promise that God gave to the prophet Haggai, the fulfillment of Psalm 24. And by the end of the week, what will the people do? They will crucify him. They will crucify him. Jesus made his royal entrance into the temple that day, and very few understood or received him. Let me just close by saying, you know, there's one final place for Jesus to make his royal entrance. You know where that is? That's into your heart. That's into your heart. It's important to understand that not everyone who sings God's praise really receives him as king. They were singing the praises of God, but they really didn't receive him as their king king. And so it's not enough simply to say that Jesus is the king. It's not enough to say Hosanna. You have to enthrone him in your heart. And if you're not a Christian, Jesus now stands outside the gates. He's not simply hoping to gain entrance. He's demanding it. He's presenting himself as the king. And he's saying, open your heart. Would you be willing today to say, enter in, O King of glory. Enter into my heart. There's a welcome place here in this heart, in this temple for you, the true and rightful King. Let's bow for prayer together. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you, who triumphed over death, who now reigns in glory as the king of heaven and earth. And he comes to you today and he asks you to open your heart and let him in. Have you done that? Are you absolutely certain of that? Because, friend, this is the most important thing. The most important decision of your life is to open your heart and say, enter in, king of glory. Father, I pray that you'll open the eyes of every heart if it hasn't happened already for people to see who Jesus truly is and that there would be an open, receptive heart that they'll turn to Christ and realize he is the sin bearer. He is the one who paid the price for our sins and that there's only one way to heaven. That's through faith in Christ putting their absolute faith in Christ. Speak to hearts, Father. Heads bowed, our eyes closed. How many here say, that's my prayer. I want to trust Jesus fully as my Savior, as my Lord. I want to open my heart to the King of glory. And friend, if that's your prayer, would you just pray that? Would you just tell the Lord that? Jesus, enter in my heart today. Save me, Lord Jesus. Beloved, he will save you. He will. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God. Does he have full control of your life? Have you enthroned him over every area of your life? Father, again, thank you for this beautiful narrative, this momentous day in the history of redemption. Help us, Lord, to truly make Jesus Lord and sovereign King over all that we have and all that we are. May we truly enthrone him as the King of glory in our heart and our life. And we pray in Jesus' precious name.